In Top Gear this week, Tiffany Dell drives Vauxhall's top of the range Omega. Quentin Wilson advises on buying a second hand polo. And Chris Goffey reports from Silverstone on the best in historic. The tape. in Top Gear. I have in my hand a piece of paper which says that Rover is perfectly safe in BMW's hands. A good job too because at the Geneva Motor Show this week Land Rover is launching facelifted versions of both its Range Rover and the Discovery. Now naturally we'll be bringing you a report on that in a couple of weeks time but because the spotlight is so very firmly on Rover right now Later in this programme, we'll be looking at the new jewel in BMW's crown. We'll be seeing just how these British war horses stand up to the Japanese competition. This is Vauxhall's new corporate logo. It'll be seen on the next generations of Corsa, Astra and Cavalier. But first, it will be seen on the all-new Omega. The Omega will be on sale next month. It replaces both the Carlton and the Senator and comes with four engine options. Two litre 16 valve, two and a half litre diesel turbo, two and a half litre V6 and three litre V6. Now, as well as those four different engines, there are five different trim options. Starting with Select, then GLS, CD, CDX, and top of the range Elite. So what else does the press pack tell us? The marketing story, no. Equipment highlights, boring. Body design, no. Chassis dynamics, Ah, Formula One style traction control. Now that looks worth testing. Perhaps we'd better try it with the traction control on. So, the traction control works and all those worries about rear-wheel drive, rear-end breakaways can be forgotten forever. You'll have noticed, of course, that the test car is left-hand drive and that's because it was one of the Opel Omegas used at the model's launch in Portugal. Opel, Vauxhall's German brother in the General Motors Group, produces the Omega for the rest of Europe and Japan and sells it in only three trim levels, GL, CD and MV6. But otherwise, the vehicles are identical. Now, traction control apart, what else impressed on the Omega? Well, it's got all those little touches of luxury you can think of. It's got all the latest safety features. The visibility is very good, but I do feel as I'm sitting rather high and the seat won't go any lower. The steering wheel is virtually on my knees and there's no adjustment. Now we're told that's because the wheel is set at the optimum angle for the airbag. This is the 2.5 V6 and the engine has got a rather fussy tappity noise but there's plenty of low down torque and it's got good performance. This is a car the Vauxhall hope will challenge the BMW 525. The handling is very safe but it is rather soft. There's a lot of body roll during cornering. 
It's not really what I would call a driver's car. Mind you, it's rather nice back here. Although about the same size overall as the Carlton, they've increased the rear knee room by one and a half inches, so there's plenty of space. And with the saloon, there's now a three-point harness with the fifth seat. Now this I like, my own heater control separate from the drivers, and in all but the select trim, there's a passenger's airbag as standard. Given how radical they were with the Corsa, it's perhaps a shame they weren't a little bit more adventurous with the shape of the Omega. One nice touch, though, is this badged boot handle. As you'd expect, there's plenty of room in there. The body shell is much stiffer than the old Carlton, the anti-corrosion is advanced, and it's bang up to date with security and immobilizers. Overall, the Omega proved a solid, capable performer, and all models come in both saloon and estate versions. Hopefully, ours was the only noisy engine, but the air conditioning also gurgled like a pregnant dishwasher. And having said the visibility was good, I did become more and more aware of an annoying blind spot caused by the door mirror and the A-pillar. The 2.5 V6 has impressive low-speed torque, but it will need a sports version to challenge BMW for real driving satisfaction. The three litre comes only in the leather elite trim. With an extra 40 horsepower, it looks sure to maintain the impressive standards set by the Senator. The 16 valve two litre will doubtless attract many young executives, especially with the select trim that has six option packages to tailor the car to the driver's taste and tax limit. For the turbo diesel, GM bought the best engine in its class, the intercooled BMW power plant. Manufactured to a slightly different specification and sure to attract the diesel lovers. All in all, then, a pretty comprehensive lineup. And it needs to be, because it's cost GM £720 million to develop these four models. And just think, for an extra 80, they could have bought Rover. Silverstone, last July, the Coys International Historic Festival, arguably the greatest collection of classic racing cars and their drivers we've ever seen. First out to do battle were the GT cars, MGs, Alphas, various Lotai and Austin Healys. The lineup also included one S Moss in a Ford Shelby Mustang. However, it soon became obvious who the pace setters would be, with the Alan Lloyd E-Type locked in mortal combat with a Ferrari 250 GT, and the redoubtable Frank Sittner in Sir Anthony Bamford's Ferrari GTO pushing really hard with these two being hotly pursued by Simon Draper's Aston Martin, how many millions of pounds were sliding around out there? Mike Wiles, you're about to take over the Ferrari 250 GTO from uh, Nick Mason, uh, an awesome responsibility. Uh, yes, uh, several million responsibilities, I think. <laughs> do, do you really race hard in a car like that? Absolutely. You can't really think about the value of it. Um, Nick's wonderful. It's an honour to be asked to drive the car. Uh, so you put it to the back of your mind and you just get in and do the job. It's wonderful. You still run these cars in the rain and you run them at speed. It amazes me. Yes, it amazes me sometimes, I think. <laughs> it seems a really stupid way to behave, doesn't it? But, but everybody goes really hard. I mean, it's not a gentleman's racing, is it? If one just wanted to parade the cars, there's a million opportunities for parades. What's fun is to actually get the cars running, you know, moving properly. And, and you let somebody else do it? Oh, yes, but generally um, quite well-chosen people. I mean, not just don't bother to write in. 
There was also the chance to get really close to some classic racers, like Jackie Stewart's 1964 championship winning Cooper T72. Stewart's Cooper made up part of a British racing green display, the top 30 landmark cars showing the history of the famous colour. And in the parade, the most evocative car here, the Hamilton Rolt Le Mans C-Type. Duncan, you, you won uh, the Le Mans race in 53 in this car. What, what do you remember of it? What's the outstanding memory? Well, it was a very good race, and we led it most of the way. Um, the car was perfect. I remember in your biography, you were talking of um, getting wheel spin at um, Le Mans on the Mulsanne Strait. You, you thought the clutch was slipping because the revs were going up. Uh, what, what sort of speed was that? About 160 or something like that. And then um, she was just beginning to slip. We hadn't got proper tyres in those days. But, I mean, 160 miles an hour 40 years ago on those sort of tyres, you must have been very brave. Well, you know, uh, a Dakar in the, D, in the long nose D out doing over 200 40 years ago. Other notable reunions in the parade included Sterling Moss in the Van Wall, later to be seen racing in anger, Sir Jack Brabham in the Cooper Climax, the car that started the rear-engine revolution in Formula One, and the elegant driving style of Roy Salvadori in a 250F Maserati. And in the 1914 TT winning Sunbeam, the irrepressible Barry Wizzo Williams. It's quite surprising. It's a very nice ride and it's very balanced and it actually goes where you point it. You have to move the wheel very little and if you move it a bit too much, you get a voice from the left. Oops, or something, you know, it's a passenger. But he's pushing, thrashing away, putting pressure into the fuel tank. But it's very good. The only thing is the brakes. I never did actually find the foot brakes, so I had to use the one on the outside here. Now, apart from all the action on the track and the glorious cars you can see out there racing over this weekend, there's also an auction here at Silverstone held by Coys. You can buy anything from a comparatively recent Minardi Grand Prix car to this glorious 30s Alpha 1750. But my favourite car of the auction is this Lego Talbot, once raced by Duncan Hamilton. And to me, it sums up everything that a proper racing car should look like. No, you're just testing the light. You shouldn't do that, sir. It could have cost you. Thank you, and your number, if I may. Stars of the sale included a Lola Aston Martin, which fetched 156 grand, and this immaculate Lancia Aurelia, which smashed its £30,000 reserve and went on to fetch £61,000. Meanwhile, back on the track, David Brabham, son of Sir Jack, was C-type mounted in the sports car race. The front row, however, was dominated by Maserati, an incomparable sight, a 450S, a 250S, and finally a 300S, surely a royal flush. More memories of Le Mans on the Aston Martin stand, the victorious 1951 DB2s. Tell me how often these team cars get together. Uh, well, they haven't been together, I think, for about five years. And prior to that, they hadn't been together for, for, since 1951, which was quite extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's lovely to see them all out today. Why are the grills all painted different colours? That was a recognition for, for, for the um, people in the pits, the timekeepers. Uh, they could see the, which car was coming before they could see the number. And with some of them you'll find they've got uh, recognition lights on, on, the, on the back. That one, for instance, got a blue light. Back on the circuit, the historic Grand Prix cars were reliving the contests of former years. Again, this was no genteel parade. These guys were driving in earnest and fighting every inch of the way. 
Oh, well, a couple of dented panels and egos, no real harm done. But when you can see Willie Green, for instance, looking every inch of Fangio in the 250F Maserati, there's little wonder these meetings are so hugely popular amongst enthusiasts, young and old. It's simply the sight, sound and smell of wonderful racing cars being driven as they were meant to be. There are plenty of extra strong reasons why you ought to buy Volkswagen's compact confection. It won't cost you a mint, it certainly won't have any holes in the middle, and it's refreshingly long-lasting. The Polo preempted the Fiesta by three years and the Metro by six, and it's better built than both. Even a Peugeot 205, once hailed as the best small car in the world, doesn't even come close to the Polo's longevity. So, if you fancy a crack at a second-hand VW Polo, these are the ones worth going for. Avoid pre-81X cars, they're too old. 85 on polos have five-speed gearboxes and better brakes. The hatchback versions sell much better than the saloons. The basic C models have rather Spartan Brillo pad interiors. And the 90 on facelifted polos have fuel injection, catalytic converters and servo brakes. And because they're not in the least bit trendy, prices are on the cheap side. A decent one with tax and MOT starts from £1,000 or so. This tidy B-plate car could be yours for £1,000. £2,000 gets you a reasonable mileage E-Reg 1.3 CL. £3,000 puts you firmly in F or G-plate territory. And 4,000 buys the best, a facelifted H or even J-plate 1.3 GL. Simple and uncomplicated, the Polo makes a hardy shopping shuttle with a rust-resistant body and few mechanical nasties. So if you do fancy taking one on board, what exactly should you look for? A clonking from the front means the drive shaft could be about to go out to lunch. Oil leaks from the cam cover can drip down and contaminate and ruin the alternator. That funny silver thing is a fuel pump and it's known to leak a bit of oil. Polos have a tendency to warp and wear their brake discs too. And while we're on the subject of brakes, early polos were disinclined to stop. And the rather vague and woolly steering won't be the best you've ever felt either. And finding a proper polo shouldn't wear out your fillings. They're usually owned by careful suburban mummies who don't crunch them and make them last and last. So the polo might not be that fresh, but it's a little sweetie that's not going to cost you a packet. We British, well, most of us anyway, will maintain that we make the best off-road cars in the world. But if you go to Japan, they'll tell you that they do. So what I've done is come to a neutral country which has some great off-road driving. And with the help of some neutral judges, we're going to settle this thing once and for all. For centuries, the camel has reigned supreme in the Arabian desert. It's economical, it's entirely fitted out with leather upholstery, and the ventilation is very good. But as usual, man thinks he can do better. From Britain, the Range Rover and the 3.9 litre Discovery. And from Japan, the Nissan Patrol, the Toyota Land Cruiser and the Mitsubishi Shogun. We wanted to find a winner over the steep banks and in the soft sand, which is as hard for a car as the sticky mud we're more used to in Britain. 
The judges were a group of locals and expats who spend their lives driving around the desert, sometimes because they need to go somewhere where there is no road, and sometimes, like now, because it's there and because it's damn good fun. After we'd all had a go in all of the cars, it was time to work out what we all thought. Besides, the camels were getting frightened. Mohammed Mata is a rally driver who normally has his pedal welded to the metal, but the discovery, it seems, was too much even for him. The discovery, I was very impressed with, with that car. I didn't uh, expect it to be... I mean, the Range Rover has more power, but the, the discovery is, is um, how can I say it, more, much more smoother. And it goes, you know, you, you, it just never stops. Actually, sometimes uh, I was lifting up. <laughs> I d yeah, I didn't expect the car to go that, that fast. But the Range Rover is, OK, it's a 4.2 engine, but it's not that powerful. It's underpowered. I mean, it seems to be underpowered. The car that smashed Land Rover's dominance all over the world was Toyota's Land Cruiser. Once a huge, ugly barge, it's now smooth and sophisticated, with real presence and more toys than Hamleys. In many ways, you'd expect the Toyota Land Cruiser to score a memorable victory. It has an astonishing reputation for reliability. It's spacious. It has an enormously powerful four-and-a-half-litre engine. But I do find it amazing in a car that has a fridge here between the two front seats. There are no diff locks. Oh, dear. When we are handing out the prizes at the end of the day for the car that's got stuck the most, this one's going to win hands down. I wasn't the only one in trouble either, but Belinda Ali Khan was far too polite and ladylike to blame the machinery. Um, soft sand, I think. Soft sand and perhaps the fact that it's an automatic, just a bit slow to kick in. But what do you reckon then, the old Land Cruiser? Well, I think it's a very good car. The 4.5 is um, tremendously powerful. Um, it was unfortunate what just happened, but uh, I think it was soft sand. But I think it's a good car, yes, very good car. I think it's incredible that diff locks are an option in Dubai when the British versions come with three as standard. Still, no such silliness with Mitsubishi's Shogun, and it showed. I really am very impressed, because the Land Cruiser couldn't get up the slope and this just romped up it. Yeah. Is that diff locks? I think probably is. In this sort of stuff, yes. There's the soft sand, you need as much... Uh, you need as many of the wheels gripping as can grip, and the diff lock helps that. No, I'm, 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 I was amazed. And it's even quite comfortable when you're landing from 30,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but on its side. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stop, stop, stop. John Watts, like me, likes Range Rovers, which is why he owns three one to go with each of his houses. This one was different, though, because it's the new long wheelbase version with air suspension. However, it still has the old Range Rover problem. John, dear boy, not only are you stuck, but also this has come off the front of your car. Which uh, is embarrassing, yeah? Well, it's not really embarrassing to me. It may be to the manufacturer here. <laughs> it tends to be something that happens quite frequently here. So I mean, it's ridiculous, surely, to offer a car that's going to be driven in the desert with all this gubbins on the front. Well, in fact, no, I was taking the bumps a little bit quicker than I normally would. Um, this car tends to be a little bit heavier than the ordinary one, the 98-inch bit. For that reason, <coughs> you have to hit the bumps a bit faster to maintain road speed. Yeah, well, we're going to need some glue now, John. Um, I'm afraid that's going to be your department. I'm going back to work. <laughs> OK, so Range Rovers are at their best on the road, where their arrogant, upper-class superiority shines through. But what about out here? What about the ultimate desert vehicle? It really did seem that the Nissan Patrol would not be bettered. Mohammed, I've been out in Dubai, what, for a week now. Everybody's telling me that the Patrol is the best off-road car of them all. Well, uh, I mean, 
If you are really going off-road all the time, I mean, if you don't need the car for, uh, I mean, if you are not driving on motorways or something like that, it's, I mean, the car is good. It's very powerful. It has plenty of torque and, uh, you know, just the car never t stops if you know how to drive the car, of course. And it's, you know, it seems to be one of the best cars here. Now, remember, he liked the Discovery, but he didn't like it as much as I did. And that was a surprise. I've always thought of the Discovery as a sort of poor man's Range Rover. But out here, it's knocking its big brother into a cocked hat. And the reason is simple, ride comfort. You have to drive fast in soft sand so you skim over the surface, and that, in the other four cars, was deeply uncomfortable. I argued this point as we considered a verdict at the traditional Uzi, a picnic of whole roast cheap stuffed with fruit and nuts. But I was told quite firmly that comfort is not as important as traction and that neither is as important as sophisticated air conditioning, something old Range Rovers used to fall down on. It's most important here, yeah. especially for um, you know, the, the back passengers or rear passengers. Mm. They only uh, did this in the Range Rover this year. And that's why um, everyone was buying different cars, and Japanese cars. I think it's a great all-round car and it's got bags of prestige here. It handles well. But this particular one that we've got, the LSE, with the air suspension and the 4.2, I think it's overrated, it's too heavy, and it doesn't handle particularly well here. So they've overdeveloped it almost? Yeah, you could say, you could say that for this application. Mm. And that spoiler will always mean endless trips to the dealer, a problem you don't have with the Patrol. I had mine for the last uh, three years, and I had about 200,000 uh, kilometres on it, and I have no problem with it, I never stopped in it. And... Hasn't the dashboard fallen off yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> right. Well, I'm afraid they won't be dissuaded. They like the new Discovery very much indeed, but they say the winner is the Nissan Patrol. It's probably fair to say that the Patrol is 5 or 10% better than the Discovery off-road, but on it, the Discovery is better by 50 or 60%. And then there's the question of style. You cannot turn up at a yacht club in a Nissan Patrol because everyone looking out of the window will laugh at you. People out here agree, when it comes to class, you have to buy British. Well, British-ish. In Top Gear next week, Fiat's new Super Mini with a six-speed gearbox. Beauty and the Beasts, the ultimate in two-wheeled decoration. And the Gordon Keeble, a might have been classic from the 60s.